young members chair, and we're looking for a trails co-chair. So again, if you have any interest in those, uh, please contact me, okay? Uh, make sure you're watching the website for updated outings. Uh, we're still doing hikes. Uh, as Jill said, we're, we're doing them doing the, during the week and the weekend, and sometimes they're scheduled uh, a little later than we like. So there might be something scheduled, say, for this weekend that might appear tomorrow. So always be checking that, okay? And that's about it for this month. So I think we're good to go, Jill. Jill, you're on mute. Okay, tonight our speaker is Jerry Miller and he's going to speak to us about the Great Bear Rainforest. Jerry has traveled extensively to photograph wild animals. He's given a presentation at ADK before and his been living here the last couple of years. And he has beautiful photographs of uh, animals in the wild. And I'd like Jerry to, to introduce you to Jerry so he can tell you about his presentation tonight. Let's unmute Jerry. <gasps> okay, thank you, Jill. You're welcome. Should I share my screen now? Or yes, you can share now, Jerry. Okay. All right, so the Great Bear Rainforest, it is one of the most amazing wilderness areas in North America. So where is it located? It's on the central and north coast of British Columbia. The southern boundary is in Knights Inlet, which is 150 miles north of Vancouver. And it stretches 250 miles up to the uh, southeast Alaskan border. It covers 15.8 million acres, and it's primarily, primarily roadless. So what is it? It is one of the largest remaining tracts of unspoiled tempered rainforest left in the world. It's home to 26, nation, 26 First Nations that overlap the region. And it's home to an amazing variety of wildlife, grizzly bears, black bears, cougars, coastal wolves, eagles, orcas, humpback whales, seals, stellar sea lions. And it's especially, it's the only home of the spirit bears. It's the only place in the world that spirit bears exist. There's five species of salmon that spawn there and they are really the lifeblood of the Great Bear Rainforest. So a little bit of history. In uh, 1997, the central and northern BC coastal region was renamed the Great Bear Rainforest by a network of environmental non-governmental organizations, including Greenpeace, Sierra Club BC, Pacific Wild, Stand.Earth, for the purpose of an international campaign to protect the Great Bear. It took 19 years of negotiations and preliminary agreements. And finally in 2016, the BC government First Nations, environmentalists, and the forest industries agreed to a final agreement that protected 85% of the 16 million acres of, for, from industrial logging, but it just protected from logging. It didn't protect the wildlife and didn't add other protections to the Great Bear. So this map kind of shows what parts were fully protected what parts were in restoration and uh, different percentages of protection in those areas. So the overview from my trip is I booked it with Blue Waters Adventures. It's a uh, company out of Canada. It was nine days of wildlife viewing uh, using the 68 foot catch, the Island Odyssey as a home base. 
the Odyssey had a crew of four. There were 10 other passengers plus myself. We started the trip in Prince Rupert. We traveled as far north as the Kutsumatin Grizzly Sanctuary. And we'd go as far south as Princess Royal and Gribble Islands. We explored different areas with uh, kayaks, zodiacs, and sometimes by foot. And we would end up in Kitimat. The picture on the left, the uh, sailboat there, that, that's the island Odyssey. So this map is just an overview of the area that we traveled through. And I have uh, different maps as we go through this. So to get to uh, Prince Rupert, the easiest way is there's several flights a day nonstop from Toronto to Vancouver. And once you get to Vancouver, there's one morning flight and one afternoon flight to get up to Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert Airport is on Digley Island, which is off the coast. And the airport supplies a shuttle bus. You get on the shuttle bus, the shuttle bus gets on a ferry, takes you across the inlet, and it'll drop you off in the middle of uh, Prince Rupert. I took this picture from uh, flying from Vancouver to Prince Rupert. It's a picture of the coastal mountains as we flew north. So I stayed overnight the first night and then uh, the first day of the trip we met up in Cow Bay Marina in Prince Rupert. It was a small boat marina. After introductions, a safety briefing, we were all assigned cabins. We headed north up through Chatham Sound and we overnighted in Quinn Mass Bay. The uh, map on the right, that red line is the path that we took to get up to Quinness. So this is a view from the ship as we travel north. We also had uh, four single kayaks and one double on board. Another view from the ship. We also towed two Zodiacs and it was a Canadian registered ship. This is uh, Quinn Mass Bay where we anchored for the first night. So the second day of the trip, we got up, we were in Quinn Mass and we decided to, a few of us took the kayaks out to explore the bay and uh, we had an interesting experience with some humpback whales. Later on, we headed down Kudamantean Inlet and we spent some time with a pod of orcas. And eventually we had a uh, orientation for the Grizzly Reserve and we would overnight in Kudamantean Inlet at the base of the inlet. So as we travel around the bay in kayaks, there was a lot of birds. This is a surf bird. And the birds in the back, I think they are uh, turnstones. There were a lot of meganses in the bay and lots and lots of eagles all over. So as we were paddling around the bay, we heard some sounds up in the main channel, which is steam of passage. That sounded like whales, but we didn't see anything. So we decided to paddle out there to see what we could find. So when we get out there, we found a couple of humpbacks that were sleeping. So humpbacks sleep generally horizontally. They'll sleep on the surface. Sometimes they'll sleep vertically. But humpbacks, like all cestations, are conscious breathers. So they have to be awake to breathe. So what they are is they're what's called unihemispherical sleepers. Half their brain sleeps at a time. So they'll sleep for about a 20 minute period and half their brain will be awake so they can breathe. The other half will be asleep. The next time they sleep, the other half of their brain will go to sleep. So over the course of 24 hours, each half gets about four hours sleep. So humpbacks are baleen whales. 
They have no teeth. They have baleen uh, material that hangs from their top jaw. Baleen whales have two blowholes. Two whales have one. Baleen have whales have one blowhole for each lung. They are 39 to 52 feet long. They weigh 28 to 33 tons. Females are larger. They live 45 to 100 years. This population migrates to British Columbia in the spring to feed. They stay there and they feed till fall. Then they travel to their calving grounds. Some go to Hawaii, some go to Baja, Mexico, some go to east, some islands east of Japan. They don't eat during their winter migration. They won't eat again until they come back to British Columbia. Their average migration is about 2,500 miles, it takes them about four to six weeks, and it's the longest migration of any mammal. Humpbacks are generally solitary. They do cooperate to feed, but the only really social structure with humpbacks is between moms and calves, and the calves will stay with their moms for about a year. So this is a picture from behind the humpback. Those are the blowholes. So two different theories how humpbacks got their name. One is that there's a small hump in front of their dorsal fin. It's more prominent on some of the whales. Uh, the other theory is that they got their name from the way they arch their back when they dive. When humpbacks dive, they generally stay down for three to five minutes, but they can stay down for 30 minutes or a little longer. Their tail fluke is approximately 12 foot across. And when they do a really deep dive, you'll see that fluke is completely vertical out of the water. Uh, they can dive to 200 meters, which is about 660 feet. Their pectoral fins are about one third of their body length, which this, they average about 18 feet long. So humpbacks were hunted from the 1800s and they almost went extinct. In 1965, they were protected in the British Columbia waters. Uh, they protected humpbacks and blue whales and in 1972, I think it was, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in the United States, which made it illegal to hunt whales in US waters and for American citizens to hunt whales. And then in 1985, the International Whaling uh, Commission uh, had a moratorium on all whale hunting that went into effect in 87, but Japan, Norway, and Iceland still do some whale hunts. Right now, there's 14 different populations of humpbacks around the world. The worldwide population is about 40,000, and uh, that's about only one third of what the historical population was. So orca whales, orcas are more commonly called killer whales, which is actually a misinterpretation of the term whale killers. When sailors first saw uh, orcas, they saw them attacking small whales. So they called them whale killers. And that name got twisted around to killer whales. But they're actually not whales at all. They're actually the largest member of the dolphin family. They are average about 23 to 32 feet. They weigh six tons. They live between 40 and 90 years. And they are apex predators. Nothing hunts uh, orcas other than humans. But there's two recognized ecotypes in the great bear. There's resonance and transients. Resonance feed on salmon and transients feed on seals, sea lions, small whales and sharks and transients have a bigger range than the resonance do. 
Orcas are very highly social. The pods are matriarchal. Males and females stay in their natal pods for life. They do go out of their pod to search for mates during mating season. This is a photo of a small pod that we saw in the Cooper team. The, the, the orca with the uh, small dorsal fin in the front is the mom. Females have smaller dorsals than males. And the two behind her are two of her sons. Orcas are in every ocean in the world and they are the most widely distributed mammal next to humans. This is another photo of the same pod going down the channel, uh, mom in the middle. And researchers have found that orca pods with grandmas in the pod, the, the uh, calves have a greater chance of survival than when there's not a grandma in the pod. Because they think that, that the calves learn things from the, the grandmothers. This is a different pod. This was uh, definitely a transient pod. They were hunting seals. And researchers have also seen when a transient pod is successful in a seal hunt, they will feed the oldest female in the pod first. So after we saw the uh, orcas, we anchored in the bottom of the Kutmazin, and uh, we stayed there overnight. This is a picture of the Kutmazin Inlet with the Odyssey in the background. So the third day we woke up, we were in the Kutmazin. Uh, we spent a lot of time that day looking for bears. When the tide came in, we went into the uh, estuary and we anchored overnight up in Paradise Passage. This is a map of the Goosley Reserve. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the morning in Zodiacs traveling up along the uh, shoreline. We saw one adult bear, but he was kind of far back up in the tree line eating, uh, we think, crab apples. But after we were in the Zodiacs for a couple hours, this young grizzly came walking out of the forest. He was probably around four years old. Uh, bears are omnivores, so they eat everything. He came down to the shore looking for clams and mussels, wherever he could find, and fish. There were nothing that we saw down there. They do rely real heavily on uh, salmon in the Great Bear Rainforest. They get most of their stores of fat during the salmon runs so that they can hibernate. This is another picture of him as he was down along the coast. Uh, there was not very many fish around. So he hung out there for a while and we watched him and he eventually went back up into the forest and we headed back to the ship to have some breakfast finally and uh, waited for the tide to come in. So the Grizzly uh, Sanctuary was established in 1994. It's the only grizzly bear sanctuary in Canada. It covers 109,000 acres and it has about 60 grizzlies in the sanctuary. The BC Parks and the Coast Sinchimian First Nations collaboratively manage the uh, sanctuary. Only one group of 10 people with a licensed outfitter is allowed into the estuary every day during high tide. There's no overland travel. You go in on the Zodiac and you travel through it in a Zodiac. So as we went into the uh, sanctuary, this was a harbor seal that was also making his way in. We didn't count him as part of the 10. Lots of uh, eagles there. We did see a couple of salmon. Salmon are uh, 
really the, the uh, keystone species in the Great Bear. There are five different species of salmon that spawn in, in the Great Bear. There's uh, pink, chum, coho, chinook, and sockeye. Chum has the shortest, uh, shortest lifespan, about two years, and chinook has a lifespan of about seven years. So we didn't see very many, we didn't see any bears inside the sanctuary, lots of tracks, but that's kind of how it goes when you're looking at wildlife. You kind of get what you get. What you get. This is a uh, immature bald eagle. They get their white heads and tails when they're about four years old. He looks like he captured some kind of bird that's not a fish scales. We looked around a little more. We didn't see any bears in there. Uh, we had to go back out. The tide was starting uh, to ebb. So we went back to the ship and headed out and spent the night in Paradise Passage. So the plan the next morning is we were gonna kayak. A few of us were gonna take kayaks and kayak through a channel to the east side of Hogan Inlet to explore some kelp beds. When we left the ship, it was uh, raining and the storm got pretty bad as we got into the channel. So we turned around, went back to the ship, loaded up the kayaks and headed back down Chatham Sound. We would go down through uh, past Prince Rupert into the top of Grenville Channel and overnight in Kumalan Inlet. We did have a visitor that night. So this was what the scene looked like as we traveled down Chatham Sound. This was after the storm was passing. And this was sunset in Kumalan Inlet. Uh, the storm had passed and we got a nice sunset. And this was our visitor. She uh, hauled out on one of the pontoons for the Zodiacs. What you can't see is she did have wounds on her back. So we think she had escaped from a, uh, an orca and she uh, spent the night. The next morning we had up, she was still there. She was real comfortable. So we left her alone and uh, she didn't leave till we started getting things ready to start exploring the, exploring the inlet. So we were in Kumalan Inlet. We explored Kumalan Inlet that day and we would travel down the Grenville Channel into Wright Sound and spend the night in Hawke Bay. So th this is the inlet in the morning. That again is the uh, Odyssey. We never anchored anywhere where we saw any other boat. We were always by ourselves everywhere we went, which was kind of nice. This was just uh, in the inlet, some reflections. We did see some uh, lion's mane jellyfish. They, they are the largest jellyfish species in the world. They average, have an average size bell of about a foot and a half, but they can grow to where they have a bell of six feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded had a bell of seven feet and it had tentacles 120 feet long. This is actually looking at him on the bottom. He's turned over here. This is a view of going down Grenville Channel. The uh, sun finally came out. First time we saw the sun in four or five days. And as we went down the channel, we passed this guy and he was on the side. He was foraging around looking for some food himself. And as we got into right channel, we saw a uh, humpback that was breaching. And researchers think there's a couple of reasons why they breach. One reason is to get parasites off their skin. Another reason is for communications. They think that when they, well, when they come out, they make a hell of a noise when they 
hit the water again. And uh, it tells other humpbacks in the area that they're there. And the third reason they think they do it just to have a lot of fun, just because it's fun to jump out of, out of the water. So after the night in Hawke Bay, we uh, headed down through Campion Sound and into Racy Inlet, which is on Princess High, Royal Island. We uh, would stop at a Stella sea lion colony on the way. And then we took a small hike in the rainforest that afternoon. So when we left Hawk Bay and got into Campia Sound, we came upon a couple of humpbacks that were laying on top of the water and they had a log between them. And at first we had no idea what that they, they were doing. We thought maybe they were somehow tangled in a fishing net or something, but uh, Brian, who was the captain, killed the engines and we sat there and drifted for a while and watched them. And what they were actually doing is they were playing with the log. They were taking the log with their flippers and they were rolling it up and down their back. Maybe they were scratching their back with it. We had no idea, but the crew on the boat who spends a lot of time in these waters had never seen any behavior like that before. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, and the picture on the top right, those bumps on the whale's head is actually hair follicles. So th this is the uh, Stella sea lion colony. And we, we anchored a bit away and got into the zodiacs. You have to be a little cautious around these colonies because if you panic them, they will stampede and they'll crush the little uh, sea lions. So we were pretty cautious. We came close to them pretty slowly and quietly on the Zodiacs and just quietly kind of passed back and forth. So Stella sea lions are the largest member of the eared seal family. They're named after George Steller, who was a, uh, scient a surgeon and a naturalist. Females are seven and nine feet long. They weigh up to a thousand pounds. They live about 30 years. Males, are nine to 11 feet. They weigh 1,500 to 2,400 pounds. They live 15 to 18 years. They are carnivores. They eat fish, squid, and octopus. So the sea lions come to the uh, rookeries like around the middle of May, and they'll stay there till about the middle of September before they head back to the deeper oceans. Uh, females come there and they will have their pups. And a couple of weeks later, they're ready to mate. The males, this is a big male. He was probably in the 200 to 2000 pound range and about 11, 12 feet long. Males get there earlier at, to claim their territories and they will stay out of the water for a couple of months. Uh, protecting their, their territory and mating with the females. This little guy was probably a yearling. He was my uh, favorite one for the day, trying to look like a tough guy. And they do molt after uh, the mating season. And then about mid-September, they'll, they'll leave the rookery and they'll head uh, to the ocean back into the deeper ocean. So th this is Racy Inlet, uh, sunset, uh, the night we spent in Racy Inlet. That evening, the whole group took a uh, short hike up through a small portion of the rainforest. It was a little difficult for some. Uh, we didn't go too far. There is really no trails. You just kind of make your way up around over things to uh, get into the rainforest. So the plan for the next day was we would leave Racy Inlet, head up to the Whale Channel and go up to Hartley Bay. We uh, did take another hike. In the morning, Brian, who was the captain, said he knew where there was a waterfall a little bit up a uh, small river and uh, 
I wanted to go and a, and a gal from uh, New Zealand wanted to go. So the three of us got one of the Zodiacs and we headed up the, the small river and uh, we found a place where we could leave the Zodiac and we started to hike our way, find our way up to the waterfall. This was our trail. Uh, this is kind of how it looks in a rainforest. There's really not a trail. You just kind of weed your way around. This was another picture in the rainforest. Kind of thought this looked like a little uh, deer or something in moss. And this was another part of our trail. It took us maybe about an hour to go a mile. And when we got up to the top where the waterfall was, this black bear was sitting at the top uh, fishing. So there was some uh, salmon that were making their way up that stream and going up that waterfall. There are 2,500 different salmon runs in the Great Bear Rainforest. And there are about 190 species of animals and plants rely on salmon for uh, their nutrients. After we were there for not too long, uh, bears don't have very good eyesight, but he did catch our scent and he got nervous. You could tell he was nervous because when bears are nervous, they'll clack their teeth and they'll huff. So he got a little nervous and he went back up into the forest. We think he didn't go very far and uh, we figured he was waiting for us to leave. So we stayed there for a little bit watch the salmon make their way up. Now, this is about a 12 foot, maybe about a 12 foot drop. So after a bit, we made our way back down through the rainforest and got back on the Odyssey and uh, headed back out of the Racy Inlet. And we passed some seals on the way and as we made our way through Whale Channel and got closer to Gribble Island, we saw this uh, spirit bear coming out of the forest. So spirit bears are uh, a subspecies of the American black bear. They are not albinos. They have a blonde coat because of a single recessive gene. And when that gene is inherited by both parents, they can produce a blonde cub. Now, the Great Bear Rainforest is the only place in the world where spirit bears exist. There's estimated to be 100 to 500 spirit bears in the Great Bear Rainforest. And most frequently, they're found on Princess Royal and Gribble Islands. Research published in 2020 has found that the frequency of the white version of the gene is as much as 50% lower than previous estimates. The study also showed that areas where the spirit bear gene is most prominent, only about half those areas are in parks or in protective areas. And the reason that's important is that spirit bears are protected. You can hunt a spirit bear, but black bears are not. There's no way for a hunter to tell if that black bear is carrying the spirit bear gene. So this is the same bear. She came down to check out the, uh, the water there, see if there was anything to eat. They are pretty amazing rock climbers. We found out that this bear was uh, pretty well known to the Gitkat uh, First Nation. They call her Ma'a, which means grandma. She is 20 years old. And here she's eating berries. They do spend a lot of time eating berries and plants and uh, whatever they can get. This, I think these are called uh, shala plants. They're kind of like blueberries. So, 
spirit bears are sacred to the First Nations people. And the legend of the spirit bear for the Gitkat and Kitsu uh, First Nations tells of a time when the whole world was covered with ice and snow. And Raven, who is in their mythology, is a creator or sometimes a trickster, he decided to make everything green. But he decided that one in every 10 black bears would have blonde fur. And the reason he did that was to remind the people about the time when the whole world was covered in glaciers and life was hard. He also said that they would live in a special place. So we spent some time following her. Uh, she eventually went back up into the forest and we came upon a family of river otters. And they were kind enough to stop and let us take a family portrait. So after we left her, we anchored in Hartley Bay. And the next day we were going to uh, take a hike up through Gribble Island. And then we would head up to Eagle Bay for our last night. So th this was Hartley Bay in the morning at sunrise. The fog was just kind of burning off. And this was the Qua River. We hiked up the Qua River. It was a little easier. There was somewhat of a trail along one edge of the, uh, of the river. So trees that grow along a salmon stream, they get 90% of their nitrogen comes from, is derived from uh, salmon nutrients. So we got up to this spot in the river and we kind of spread out along the river and you could see how low it is. There were no salmon up there. There was some schooling in the bay where we started, but the river was way too low. They couldn't make it up this far. So we waited for, I don't know, maybe about an hour and a half and this guy came, came up on the other side of the, the river from us, passed us by, paid us no mind. He went upstream, uh, stayed up there maybe 45 minutes, and then he came back down, passed us again, gave us a few looks, and headed back into the forest. So we stayed a little while. We were probably there about three and a half hours or so, and we headed back out to the Odyssey headed back down the Quar River and got onto the Odyssey and went into the whale channel and came upon some humpbacks that were bubble net feeding. So one thing that humpbacks do cooperatively is bubble net feed. And bubble net feeding is not, uh, is a learned behavior. It's, it's not something that they, they pass down from their parents. It's something that's they teach each other. Bubble net feeding was first seen in the North Pacific in 1985 in Southeast Alaska. And since then it has traveled down through the whales, down through British Columbia. And what they do is five or six whales will swim together. They'll find a school of, up here it would be herring, and they'll swim around the school They'll dive down, swim around the spool, and blow bubbles. And the bubbles will make like a net. And at one point, one of the whales will give a feeding call, and they'll all swim to the bottom of the net and swim up through the middle with their mouths open and take in thousands of gallons of water and fish. Then they'll blow the water back out through the baleen, and they'll swallow the fish. This is another picture of them feeding. It, it's kind of cool when the water is uh, calm, you can see the bubbles on, on the surface. You can see here how big their uh, jaws are blown out from all the water they take in. So after we left the Wales, we spent our last night in Eagle Bay. And the next morning, we, a few of us, four of us, 
took a hike into a secondary forest. This area had been clear cut 50 years earlier. And it was kind of uh, eye opening to go into that forest after being into the, in an old growth forest. So th this is not one of my pictures. This is a stock photograph from a clear cut in uh, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia for people that are not aware of what a clear cut looks like. And this is a, a picture that I've shown you already, one of mine from when we hiked in the old growth forest. This is what a secondary growth forest looks like. This again, this is a stock picture from uh, Vancouver Island too. And, but this is what the forest we hiked in look like. None of the biodiversity came back. 50 years later, the trees did, but unlike in the, the old growth forest where we saw scat everywhere, berries, a variety of, uh, of plants. Uh, we saw very little plant life here. We saw no scat whatsoever. It just was shocking to see the difference after 50 years. So our, one of the uh, organizations that I'm familiar with is the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation. They are a team of conservationists and scientists that's dedicated to protecting the lands and waters and wildlife of coastal BC. They have research facilities in University of Victoria. They have a field site in on Denny Island and a research vessel called the Achiever. They do projects, uh, wild salmon, marine mammals, marine birds, coastal wolves, bears. They have education programs that are online. They also have youth programs and emerging steward programs. The other thing they do is they have been purchasing hunting tenures in uh, the Great Bear Rainforest. And I'll explain what hunting tenures are and what that means. And, you know, we, we kind of know that these wilderness areas never stay wilderness without lots of people that work to keep them wild and protect them. Uh, I mean, we found that out last couple of years that we saw bear's ears, we saw a grand staircase, Escalante, those sizes reduced. We saw roadless roof uh, rescinded from the Tongass that was protecting 8 million acres of old growth. Uh, we saw Anwar opened up for uh, drilling. So areas don't stay protected unless there's people to protect them. So this is a little clip of what the Rain Coast accomplished last year. This is a picture of a coastal wolf. So about the hunting tenures, uh, hunting tenure in British Columbia is a license that gives an outfitter the exclusive right 
to guide trophy hunts in specific areas in British Columbia. In 2001, the Rain Coast, uh, they led the effort to get secure a moratorium for grizzly bear trophy hunts in British Columbia. That lasted for one hunting season. The government changed hands, the moratorium was rescinded, grizzly bears were allowed to be trophy hunted. So Raincoats decided they needed a more creative approach. So in 2005, Raincoats and their First Nation partners and supporters raised one and a quarter million dollars and bought their first hunting tenure. And in 2020, they, they continued buying hunting tenures. And in 2020, they raised enough money to buy the kit load. Uh, now, the hunt, buying a hunting tenure doesn't stop native coastal, native uh, British Columbians from subsequent hunting. What it stops is trophy hunting for bears, black bears, uh, wolves, pugas. So the purchase of the kitlope was a little uh, more special this year. The fellow that you saw on that clip, Cecil Paul, he was the hereditary chief of the Anoxala people, which the Kitlope was their homeland. He was the inspiration for an international effort to protect the Kitlope, permanently protect the Kitlope from logging back in 1994, even before the Great Bear Agreements. And he worked for the rest of his life to for protection for British coastal, uh, coastal British Columbia. He was a good friend with the Rain Coast. Uh, and one of his wishes was that the wildlife in the Kitlop were protected. So it was real important that this purchase was finalized in November before uh, Cecil passed away in December. So everybody was pretty happy that, that they were able to accomplish that. So, but, you know, like I said, wild places don't stay wild without people that protect them. So with that, I'll leave you with one quote from Edward Abbey. I think everybody knows who he is. And he said, the idea of wilderness needs no defense. It only needs defenders. And my last slide is some information. The uh, company that I went with, Blue Waters Adventures, that's their website. Their IMAX did make a documentary of the Great Bear Rainforest. I haven't seen anywhere around here that it was broadcast. It was, it took three years to film it. It was directed by Ian McAllister and uh, Ryan Reynolds does the audio. You can Google it and see previews on, uh, if you Google it online. Raincoast Foundation, their website is raincoast.org. Pacific Wild is another one, pacificwild.org. And uh, Stories of the Magic Canoe is uh, the story of Cecil Paul's life, it's really interesting. And The Wild In You is a photography and poetry book about the Great Bear Rainforest. And lastly, that is my website, uh, portraitofaninstant.com. And with that, I will answer any questions. Dave, do you want to uh, share what some of the things are on the chat? Ask Jerry those questions. Uh, sure. There was one question. Uh, we get, get it. Uh, the question was: Was there any concern when kayaking of being tipped by the whales? Uh, no, we were probably. 
I don't know, maybe 50 yards away. And we were all kind of together. So we really didn't, maybe we should have, but no, it wasn't, wasn't really concerned. Thanks. There were a few comments that just complimented the beautiful pictures that you took, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, a question from Annie. Uh, she's curious if you needed to be an accomplished kayaker prior to signing on to this trip. No, and, and you didn't you didn't have to kayak. It, uh, they didn't have enough kayaks for everybody in the boat. Some people went in kayaks, some people went in zodiacs, and we traded back and forth. So some of the areas that we went in, some of the inlets, they were calm waters. They weren't it, it was pretty uh, flat water in those areas, so. Uh, Thanks. A, a couple people have asked what time of year this trip was. Was it August 2018, Jerry? August 2018 until, uh, I think it was the 28th of August till the 9th of September. Okay, uh, someone else, Richard Hensel has asked, if you could talk about the photography and how big of a lens you used, et cetera. I, at that time, I had a 150 to 600 millimeter lens and I had a 35 to 70. I had a couple of different lenses and two different Nikon bodies. But a lot of the pictures I used the 600 millimeter. Okay. At one point, Jerry, you mentioned um, that there were 60 grizzlies in this area. I don't know if you were talking about in all of the Great Bear Rainforest. No, no, that was in the, the Kudamazin Grizzly Sanctuary. Oh, okay. In that sanctuary itself, they estimate that there's about 60 grizzlies in the sanctuary. Because that doesn't seem like very many when you look at there were 100 to 500 uh, spirit bears in the Great Bear Rainforest, but... Well, if, but remember, the Great Bear Rainforest is 16 million acres. Okay. The Grizzly Sanctuary was 100,000 acres. Okay. So a big difference in land mass. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a couple other questions. Is, is that weather that you experience, the gray days, is that typical because it's in a rainforest? Typical was rain every day. I think we had rain at least at some point every day. And it was a dry year. Mm -hmm. the, you could see the streams and the rivers were really low for that time of year. Actually, 2018 and 2019 were really bad times for the salmon. And uh, they've been affected by logging because that, that changes the temperature of the streams when they log close to a salmon stream mm -hmm. and it, it induces sediment into the streams. And the other thing that's been affecting them too is uh, open net fish farms in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. the, the fish farms, uh, they spread disease to the wild population. They spread uh, parasites. When the wild salmon pass by a fish farm, they can get uh, sea lice. One sea lice on a, on a salmon fry will kill it. And they don't get that in the wild. So the British Columbia government has decided that they're phasing them out by 2025. Wow. Uh, Reinhard is, Reinhard Gesselmeyer is asking, what is the salinity of the water in the inlets compared to the ocean? Um, is it comparable to the ocean? And how it's, harsh are the winters in the rainforest? They have snow. They have snow. It gets cold. I think uh, Prince Rupert today was in the 20s. The, the inlets are, as you get closer to the streams, it's more brackish, but they're pretty salty. And depending on the time of year and and how much rain they've gotten, you know it'll get it'll get saltier. Okay. Um, Jerry, could you did you eat salmon on this trip? 
No, we didn't. You didn't? Oh, okay. No, we didn't. I yeah. wondered if you can taste, if you can tell the difference between those different types of salmon, the five different types. Yeah, well, I know you could you can see the difference between a wild salmon and a farm-raised salmon. If you look at a piece of salmon that's farm-raised, the fat lines will be much thicker. And in a wild-caught salmon, the fat lines are much thinner. Okay. Hmm. And most of the farm-raised are actually Atlantic salmon. They're not uh, Pacific salmon. Right, right, okay. Now, do ticks exist there? Do I what? Do ticks exist there? Is that a problem? Ticks? Ticks, no, I didn't see any. Didn't hear of any. Uh-huh. Okay. Does anyone else have other questions? I don't mean to be hogging it. You're welcome to unmute to ask Jerry some questions. Dave, did you have a comment? Uh, there is a question from Luke. Did you see any cougars? No cougars. I know they're there, but we didn't see any. Yeah. We didn't see any, we, we didn't see actually see any wolves either. Uh, we did see some wolf tracks, but no wolves. Uh, how, can, can I ask how much the trip costs for, for something I, like this? I think at that time it was around, I think maybe around 7,000 American. Uh -huh. Someone has asked that question. Yeah, I think it has gone up in the last couple of years. I know last year, most all the trips were because of COVID. I was actually going back last year to photograph the coastal wolves and that trip was canceled. Hopefully that'll happen this August. But it won't be on a ship, it'll be uh, more, uh, we'll be staying in one spot on a boat, but staying in one spot. Okay. Did that include the flight or was that extra? Excuse me? Did that include the air flight? No. Okay. No. And there's a couple of different outfitters. Uh, Ocean Light is another one that does trips through the Great Bear Rainforest. And they do different kinds, you know, some of them are shorter, some of them are longer. Some of them are more uh, for uh, historical things and some are more wildlife based. So it really depends on, on the type of trip that you want. This wasn't particularly a photography trip. Some of the ones that say, oh, we have somebody that's gonna come and, and help you photograph are a lot more expensive. Other questions for Jerry? Uh, there's a question from Jack Schrader. Describe the bird population within the rainforest, please. We saw lots of, uh, tons of eagles. Like I said, McGansas, we saw uh, those surf birds, a variety of different birds. I didn't really, concentrate much on birds, a lot of seabirds. Uh, another question is emergency services, were they available? We had a radio on the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, we were stopped one time by the Coast Guard to check papers, make sure that everything was up and up on the, on the boat, but for emergencies. I think the crew were somewhat medically trained for emergencies. But you're, you're pretty far, you're a day away from any big place, at least on the boat. So mm -hmm. You do have to sign medical waivers before you leave. 
you have to, you know, kind of say that you're in good shape, you're not going to die. <laughs> Wow. But, it, you know, it, it's risk and reward. I mean, you, you, you take the risk for the reward. It's any wilderness trip is that way. Anyway. Well. How did they handle the food on this trip? We actually had a cook. We had a cook on the boat. That was his whole, that was his whole job. Mm -hmm. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So it was pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Well, folks, we're going to hang out here for another few minutes. Uh, feel free to stay around and ask questions directly if you want. Uh, I won't hold everybody on here. You're welcome to leave at any point, but we'll give it another few minutes and, uh, and then we'll end it. I Thanks. would like to say thank you to Jerry for this wonderful presentation. There are many comments that say uh, thank you for the beautiful pictures that you shared and for sharing this information about the Great Bear Rainforest. It was, it was great, Jerry, thanks. Oh, thank you, Jill, for letting me uh, do this uh, presentation. Thank oh, you. well, I appreciate it greatly, thank you. So are there any, um, yeah, the question, I, I said, <laughs> applaud you greatly. Um, thank you, Jerry. People are, yeah. people are welcome to socialize. If you see someone that you'd like to Say hello to or ask questions of the group feel free to do that 